And then if it's that hard to track yourself, imagine how hard it is to then track your big top five competitors. Just <coughs> multiply it. This is one of my favorite quotes because whatever we think we are as a brand or whatever we want to be, we are the sum total of all conversations. And this is Tom Peters' quote in, um, in Search of Excellence. And I just think it is, it's, it's brilliant. So this is why we must listen. Your consumers, you might say your brand is something, but if they say it's something else, then that's exactly what it is. So listening and market research 2.0 we did not create the phrase market research 2.0, but we use it a lot. I don't know who really gets the credit for that. But we look at um, the fact that once you start listening, that's the foundation for everything you're doing. Whether it's social media, traditional media, whatever it is, there is no better place to spend your dollars. And whether it's you have no dollars and you're using free tools or you have some budget and you're going to invest in a little more robust tool than using... Um, a listening foundation. Here's how I'm going to listen. Here's how I'm going to learn where all of this is happening to start as my foundation. The next step um, there is the um, is moving into the market research 2.0. So once I've started listening and have all of this data coming in, what can I learn from that? And having really a difference, um, I'm going to jump around for a second because I, there's two things. There's brand monitoring and then there's really having a market research 2.0 platform. Brand monitoring is tools, and it can be a bunch of different things. It might be as simple as you know, Twitter search and Facebook and Google blog search or any of the other free searches out there. To kind of have a combination to listen, to keep your finger on the pulse, maybe some RSS readers. And you can do pretty effective brand monitoring to keep tabs on what's being said. Market Research 2.0 is taking it to the next step and having an analytics engine that then aggregates and processes all that information to turn out insights. Of the 10,000 posts that happened in the last three months, how many of them were positive and how many of them were negative? And after I ran a commercial or after I did a, a, a promotion, what kind of change did I see in that sentiment? What kind of change did I see in the themes and the way customers talked about us? So having the ability to really capture, measure, quantify, qualify the information that's coming through that data requires some more robust analytics capabilities. And then insights. What are you trying to learn? You know, a lot of it might not matter. There are brands out there that really don't care whether customers are saying good things or bad things. They just want them saying something. So to them, the volume is most important. Maybe you're looking for discussions specifically that are a reflection of a crisis. I have a client and he said, you know, there's not a lot of conversation about us. And we're okay with that. We're kind of an a off um, subject matter. People aren't going to be talking about us a lot. But if one of our products fails, it can be incredibly catastrophic to us. And so that's when we need to have an alert system in place to know. So depending on what kind of insights you're looking for, your strategy for how you listen and how you use your tools and the workflow therein changes. <clears throat> the, the customer service one is big. It's some of the big stories right now in the marketplace are around Comcast, for example. Comcast has historically been known for their not great customer service. And they have really put an entire team together. Now, what your opinion on Comcast and their customer service is, I don't know. But if you Twitter about them, if you put something out there in social media, there is a really good chance that you will get a response back from one of the um, digital care uh, team members there at Comcast. And again, they're using tools to monitor for those types of conversations. Not with us, unfortunately, but they are doing it, so we're glad about that. And then the other big thing is goals and time and budget. And if you're a small startup, you're not going to have a lot of budget to spend. So you're going to be relying more on free tools and a lot of your own manual labor to go through it and creating some manual processes to count, to analyze, to read, to go through, to capture that. Spreadsheets. Put them in there, put all that information and capture it. If you have a lot of budget and a lot of resources, then you open up a whole other world of options for reporting on a regular basis, for doing really interesting analytics work, for tracking multiple topics and intersecting them together and seeing what comes of it. Does anybody have any questions yet? <coughs> Jumping through too fast. So how to listen. There's really three simple steps when you talk about any of the tools, whether they're free or whether they're um, 
paid for tools. There's data retrieval, data processing, and insight delivery. The data retrieval part is actually getting to be kind of the more mainstream part. Everybody's sort of figuring that piece out now in the kind of pool of vendors that are out there. Um, when I started, everybody would boast and brag about, I have, you know, we have 50 million blogs that we track and we have 100 million news sources and everybody was like throwing out these insane numbers. There aren't that many digital <laughs> news sources and there aren't that many good quality blogs. But everybody was trying to throw as much data and big numbers into the pot. This is how much information we're analyzing. What we look to do today and what most of our competitors look to do today as well is to have quality over quantity. I don't need the 10,000 blogs that are just spam and garbage and keyword manipulation. What I'm really looking for are good news sources with their comments. I'm looking for good blogs, good message boards, good social networking sites, places where there's a lot of activity going on. And we source that data sometimes directly and sometimes through, um, through data provider partners. And all of that information comes into the big black box. And that big black box is the data processing. And that's where the big differences between vendors start to happen. So with data processing, in a free tool, for example, what you're going to see, which is really effective most of the time, is keyword search. So you type in your keywords. You can set up different queries to track that and get the information that you're looking for. But um, Paramount Pictures is my client, and they when we first started working together, they said, we are going to get caught with our pants down trying to track using keywords for the new movie Star Trek. Star Trek, if anybody here is a Trekkie, anybody a Trekkie? Okay. I was born and raised a Trekkie in my family. <laughs> so there's a huge amount of online activity without the new movie coming out. So if you are the interactive <coughs> marketing team at Paramount Pictures, and you're trying to track the effectiveness of your trailer, or your campaigns. How do you separate out the conversations about the movie versus the, all the other conversations about Star Trek? That goes beyond keywords. And that's the real differentiator um, in terms of the next power level, the next gear that you need to really track. Now, again, if you're simple, if you're, and, and it's also something to think about as you develop your business plans. Think of something that is not um, easily repeated online. If you pick something, another movie example is the movie Nine. If you type Nine in, <laughs> comes up with a lot of different results, not just the movie results. So, or if you're Apple computer, now we all know Apple for Apple, but if you're really trying to track it in social media using keywords, there's a lot of limitations. So, coming up with something that is unique makes it makes free tools with keywords much easier to use. If you don't have that luxury and you have something more complex, a more robust tool that uses natural language processing and semantic filters. So just to give you an idea, our engine is really cool because instead of, for example, for Star Trek, of giving a keywords and Boolean logic, we use document sets. And using artificial intelligence, the engine looks and reads these document sets and says, go look for content that is similar in nature. So where keywords might pick up, let's say you're looking for doctor or something having to do with doctor. If you don't type in physician with a keyword engine, you will miss the posts that specifically use physician. Whereas with more robust artificial intelligence search tools, the same post that contains the doctor wielded his scalpel will also pick up the physician lifted his knife. So it's that contextual relevance, what you're looking for online, which is that next level of, of robust search. Now, Boolean logic will also get you there in the, in the filtering and categorization. Being able to use, use good Boolean commands will help you along in that process. But again, a lot of limitations when you're looking for unique context relevant to how people are talking about something or a specific category of conversation.